Here in the Jenkins household, we are massive board gamers and we have the perpetual problem that all board gamers seem to suffer, and that is, how do we store all of our board games? I don't like Calyxes, but we have tools, precious scissors, and we know how to use them. So I built this. Down below, we have five base cabinets that feature these lovely brass handles and painted MDF shaker doors. And in some of these cabinets, you'll even find danger. But the real action is up the top here with these sawtooth hangers, which allow us to adjust the shelves, adjust the height, add more shelves whenever we want. And that is done by using these hangers that clip into the sawtooth standards and then some slats that go across and they form a shelf. And you might think, ah, oh, two pieces of wood, I guess four pieces of wood, that's not going to hold very much at all and it's going to fall down. Well, for all your doubters, that is a 10 kilo game, possibly the heaviest game to ever exist. Well, a bit over 10 kilos, but it sits there just fine. So, Building up is much easier than building down, so I'm starting with the base cabinets. Just like with last year's workshop cabinet build, I'll be using 16mm melamine for the downers. I find with a high ATB blade there is minimal chip out, if any, on the cut edges. If you are having issues cutting melamine, specific blades can help a great deal, or you can first score the cut line with a shallow saw cut. I have a standalone video on this particular edge banding machine and why I bought it. Despite its expense, now I'm on my second cabinet project with it, I have no regrets purchasing it. Previously I used plier style edge banding end trimmers. They're okay for thinner banding, but this 1mm thick ABS is really quite tough. I bought this Virutex trimmer and it is excellent. It's always great when I get to hit a tool and get the ideal result. The router table remains the quickest way to get perfectly flush edge banding on this thick ABS. I'm using Confirmat screws again, so I'm drilling the pilot holes through the sides with the Confirmat bit. Again, I'm using masking tape with a story stick drawn on it to give me the locations. One day I'll make a proper drill press table fence with stops. The back of the cabinets will be 3mm melamine faced MDF, so a single kerf in the sides and base will hold it in place. All the cabinets will be screwed together, tacking it together with some nails first stops it from shifting as easily when drilling and driving screws. Using the pilot hole in the side, I can continue the screw hole through into the base. Unfortunately, I didn't remember to drill the shelf pin holes before the cabinet was screwed together. Thankfully, I only need one shelf per cabinet. Using an offcut as a spacer allows consistent placement all around the cabinet by just resting the shelf pin jig on top of it. Rather than building a plinth, I'm attaching these cabinet leveling feet directly to the underside of the cabinets. And I'll be using a clip-on kickboard. An offcut acts as a spacer so I can get consistent spacing of the mounting brackets. The doors will match the workshop cabinets, the shaker style made out of MDF. 16mm MDF makes up the styles and rails, 9mm MDF makes up the panels. Because the rails and styles are the same width, I can start by just cutting strips that will be cut to length later. Joinery is all rebates, it's MDF, so everything will be glued together with no concerns for wood movement. After the long strips are rebated, they can be cut into the individual components, the rails and the styles. This shock made coping sled is much fancier than the previous version, but it's still just made from scraps. This allows me to safely and quickly make the rebates on the ends of the rails. The acrylic rides up against the fence, so the base of the jig is never actually cut into. Glue in the rebates, then spread with a brush. Clamps are used to keep everything nice and square before nails can be driven in along the rebate. This way I could get through all 10 doors without needing 10 sets of clamps.
Last time I painted MDF, I had horrible luck with the edges. It just kept absorbing all of the paint. Not just that, it also absorbed a lot of the primer. So this time around, I've learned my lesson. I'll be using this shellac based primer, which will seal the edges much better to actually receive the acrylic primer that I'll be using. So as I said, this is a shellac based primer. It's Zinsa's bin. Being shellac based, it's a universal primer, so you could use oil paints or water based paints on over top. Uh, and it will basically stick to anything. And that looks awful when you get it out of the tin, this real yellow color, but that's because there are a lot of solids, which is what really helps this work. So you really need to thoroughly mix it. With that mixed thoroughly, I can just brush it on the edges. It doesn't really matter if it goes further. It will sand back nicely if we want it to. And you can see that that's not absorbing in straight away. It is a little bit here. Uh, it should take about 15 minutes, half an hour to dry. Then we can always apply another coat to it uh, to properly seal it off and might give it a whole 45 minutes after that before we actually start painting. I've put two coats of the shellac sealer on all of the edges uh, and then hit it with 180 grit to just knock it back a little bit so it was nice and smooth, ready for paint. Also done the interior exposed um, end grain of MDF. So hopefully that'll soak up, finish at a normal rate now, rather than last time where I had quite a bit of extra effort having to go into the corners and that resulted in a less even finish on the doors. And I'm using a new, new to me gun, the uh, Aero Pro A610. It's quite an inexpensive, claiming to be LVLP gun. Uh, and I found it actually works pretty well, a lot better than the gun that I had previously. And it's not causing the pain in my hands pulling the trigger. So LVLP, low volume, low pressure, theoretically requires less airflow than a HVLP. So this claims to be between, I think it's 3.5 and 4.5 CFM, whereas a full size HVLP is closer around 10 to 13 CFM. So I'm not gonna give this a glowing recommendation yet, but so far this is working out quite well for a more hobbyist sized compressor that I have. So it may end up being my recommendation list once I get to be able to use it better and learn how to spray properly. Shooting video alone while wearing PPE, while aiming the camera outside of the workshop so I can spray, unfortunately leads to some pretty poor quality images. One day I'll get a spray booth and be able to take better video. And that's a coat of primer on the edges and on the faces. I've come back with Sandra and just knocked back the primer uh, where there were some dust nibs, things like that. I've also done a scrap of MDF that hasn't had the treatment, the bin, uh, the shellac sealer on the edges. And you can see just how much of that primer gets absorbed in on the edges compared to well, one that did have the shellac on it. Such a massive difference. This feels so hairy and it's still so thirsty. It'd probably take another four coats of primer just to actually seal it up. So well worth the extra effort of applying the extra sealer on the edges. So now I need to come back and do another coat of primer. Then two coats are finished. I'll keep going with the scrap as well so that we can see what the final build is to the same amount of coats. I found with my setup, Floetrol is a magic solution to spraying acrylic paint. The results end up much smoother and it sprays much easier. Ames recommend no more than 10% water and Floetrol recommends no more than 10% Floetrol. So I'm using a mix of 400ml of paint, 40ml of water and 40ml of Floetrol. Also, how great are these pour and store lids? They make it so much easier and cleaner than trying to pour over the lip of a paint tin. This is so-called Australian Floetrol. Despite being from the Flood Company, apparently there are some formulation differences compared to the American version, so your mileage may vary. Once again, shooting solo into the sun is a terrible idea. With the doors painted, the holes for the handles can be drilled, a 4.5 millimeter hole for an M4 screw with the holes 128 millimeters apart. We went with these gorgeous brushed brass D handles. They're a simple design, but the brass goes so very well against the green. Onto the bench top. I cheated and went with a big box store pre-laminated bench top because honestly, I didn't want to joint and glue something this long. Measuring in at 240 by 90 centimeters, this bench top isn't long enough for the cabinets, but it is too wide. The offcut from cutting to width can be then cut down, then glued back up to make the extra length. 
Domino's help with alignment here, but they certainly don't need for the extra strength of a 30mm top. After glue up, the new panel can be cut to length. Rather than making one extremely long bench top that would weigh in at about 60 kilos, I opted to use bench top connector bolts. These require a 35mm hole drilled about 70mm in from each edge for the nut. Then for the bolt, a groove needs to be routed from the edge to the drilled hole. A few passes provide a little bit of slop for wood movement. See, plenty of room for wiggling. The bench bolts are great for keeping everything tight, but they don't do too much for vertical alignment. A few dominoes on the wibbly wobbly setting that will remain unglued will give me that vertical alignment. Biscuits would work just fine here. The downside of the big box store bench top is often they're a bit, well, crappy and can be a bit of a mystery what you get. The wrapping it came in concealed several knots that required filling. Any edges that could be possibly touched by hands will get a 2mm radius roundover. It's subtle, but it stops things from feeling sharp. The two halves are connected at this point, so I don't accidentally round over the seam. While the panels are pre-sanded, they're big box level pre-sanded. Thankfully, I only needed to use 120 and 180 grit. They were flat, just rough. For all hardwood parts of this project, I'm using three coats of Livos Kunos. I've stuck with this finish for a while now and I'm really starting to get the application technique down pat and I love the results. I'll have to make a video covering Livos application soon. The packets of the benchtop connector bolts came with this adorable and borderline useless spanner, but I had to test it out. I hated it, but I was too stubborn to get a real sized one out. I hadn't been able to do a fully flat connection of the benchtop until now, and that's when I discovered that one of the parts was not sitting flat at all, creating a very ugly raised seam. A frustrating discovery was that my track saw isn't cutting perfectly 90 degrees. Rather than messing around trying to dial it back in for this particular project, the quickest solution was to use a router on a track. I'm taking several super light passes until I just get the whole edge being square. Finally, the main event, the upper cabinets. For the upper cabinets, the main structure is going to be made out of 12mm MDF. This may not seem super structural, but with the way that the cabinets will hold everything up, the MDF is actually doing very little lifting. Plus, end of the day, they're board games. After they were ripped to a rough size, it was easier to trim to the final size, removing any of the janky factory edges. Square one edge, then the tops could be cut out. This process can be repeated for the sides, though they're a ridiculous 1300mm long, so it really pushed far beyond the limits of my crosscut sled. If someone from Felder is watching, I think a K3 would look great in my workshop. The carcass joinery is super simple rebates. Why the router table instead of a dado stack? The router table captures more dust and it is easier to control. The results are exactly the same. The short edge gets a 12mm rebate for the top. Back's a 6mm MDF. I have to lift the cabinets up by myself at the end of the day, and if it was thicker I might struggle a bit too much to lift them. To cut the backs all to length, I've stacked all five up together and will cut them in a single pass with the track saw. Glue up is pretty simple. Glue in the rebate, brush to spread, clamp it in place while I get the back in place, panic when the back won't drop in, use some percussive force, then tack it all together with pin nails. Easy! The sheet good delivery from Plyco came with a couple of 3mm MDF cover sheets. The first of many small design tweaks was to add a faux rail to the back panel of the cabinets using strips of 3mm MDF. 
To glue on the strips, I'm using a combination of PVA and superglue. The superglue dries quickly and holds it in place while the PVA dries and forms a stronger bond. The currently exposed edges of the cabinet need to be taped up. They won't be painted, but they will have a face frame glued to it. Just like with the doors, I'm sealing the edge grain of the faux style with the shellac primer. The vertical face frame part needs to be wide enough to span two cabinet edges and to hide two sawtooth racks. All of these parts are 12mm, so the face frame ends up at 48mm. Using a 4mm cutter in the domino, two rows of mortises are cut. These are non-structural, so size 0 biscuits would work great too. Once glued, these will draw the two cabinets together and hold them there. The ideal tool would actually be a Lamello Zeta P2 biscuit cutter using their Clamex P14s. They provide a clamp-free way to attach their face frames, but those tools make Fez tool look like the budget option. With the tape off the edges of the cabinet, I can lay out the matching dominoes to receive the face frame. The spacer is used to maintain the machine settings, so no adjustments are needed. And a mock-up of a second cabinet slides right in beside it. Using a drawing bow, I could trace out a nice arch onto some MDF to act as a template for the curved face frame section. The curve is rough cut out on the bandsaw. It's better to go slow and stay on the waist side of the line than it is to go too fast and remove too much. The curve can then be refined with a flexible sanding thing. The smoother the template, the smoother the work pieces will be when flush trimmed. Curved rail blanks could be then cut to the width of the template. These curved rails will just be butt joined to the carcass, but I will add a few dominoes to keep them aligned. This is easier to do before the curve is cut in, but it also means I can use the dominoes to hold the template onto the piece for tracing and flush trimming. The idea is to stay as close to the line on the waist side. It's easy to always do a second pass or hog off a little bit more at the router table than it is to add material back on. The Paul Paint and Domino Template Attaching Method lets me hit things to attach a template. Great! At this stage we were thinking we were still painting the face frame, so I wasn't overly concerned about chip out. If there was any, I was just going to use wood fill. If I had have known it was going to be clear coated, I probably wouldn't have routed uphill. Once again using a spacer, the alignment dominoes can be cut into the upper cabinet. You can see how the face frame all starts to come together now. So when I started this project, I hadn't actually fully designed everything. I've got the functional side all done, but a lot of the details I hadn't. I'd drawn up that I wanted some uh, face frame components that would cover up the MDF edges and I probably wanted something going across the top but I hadn't quite figured it out so that's where the curve comes in and that caps that off. This is the template for it, um, it's just made out of some 12mm MDF so it was thinner than what the material was that I was working and as soon as I put the template in just to get an idea before I'd cut everything, sort of went oh no the difference in thicknesses actually looks pretty good. What do I do here? So once I'd cut all the curves off camera, I've thickness down all of the hor horizontal styles, rails, whatever this piece would be called, the curved pieces, uh, to the same thickness as the template because it actually looks a little bit better. And then I think we're gonna go for like a cap piece on top of it. This will have about a six mil reveal over top and it really sort of just finishes off the whole piece. My initial goal was to paint the face frame members the same color. And unfortunately, it actually looks pretty good not painted and uh, just clear coated. So that's what I'll be going for. So this has been an evolving design project as things have popped up. And I guess sometimes it's good to be a little bit flexible in that regard. Like with all the face frame parts, the cap pieces will be aligned with four millimeter dominoes. The cap pieces were cut oversized, dominoed, and then can be placed onto the cabinet with the face frame and use setup blocks to get the correct offset I wanted for each one. The ends of the cap pieces receive a very subtle chamfer to help with the visual transition between each step. 
This looks a lot less safe than it actually was. With the face frame out of the way, it was time to begin work on the sawtooth standards. With one face and one edge jointed, strips can be ripped down that will form the standards. They'll end up 12mm thick, 40mm wide. These strips are then ganged up. Clamps hold them in place while blue tape can be stretched around them. These were ganged in groups of four. Each cabinet needs four standards. A laser cut template allows me to quickly transfer the shape to one side of each batch. At the table saw, I'm just cutting the flat section of each saw tooth. If you are happy with 45 degree saw teeth, you could cut that section on the table saw too, but personally I find that looks a little bit, well, crappy. A shallower angle looks more elegant to my eye. The downside is it's a heck of a lot more work. The angles are rough cut at the bandsaw, connecting to the flat sections cut at the table saw. One standard was set aside as the master template. I screwed the laser cut template to it and flush trimmed at the router table. Then I could attach that master template to each individual standard and repeat the process. Screwing the master template into each standard using three screws, which will later be used to attach to the cabinets. I'm using the smallest flush trim bit I own, in this case one quarter inch, so that I can get as far into the corner of each tooth as possible. There will be a fair bit of chisel work, but this will reduce it considerably. One cabinet's worth of standards, that is four standards, ganged up with clamps. I can slowly work at making them all even. The actual angle or size doesn't matter as much as them all being even with each other. The sort of standards are finally chiseled out and they can be installed. They're just going to butt up against the workbench, so flush with the bottom of the cabinet. Uh, and the ideal position is flush with the edge of the cabinet here. This will provide a reference point for when we're clamping the face frame together. It's also going to be hidden by the face frame, so it um, doesn't really matter if there's a bit of a gap, but it's a good spot to be. And then when they're both installed on both sides that'll give us our width across for the shelves and the depth for the cleats. This is just going to get screwed in just because they don't actually need a lot of holding power. Um, all the force is going to be downwards. So the screws are really just to keep it from tilting at all. The most grueling part of this project was to make the cleats and slats for the shelving. Individually this isn't a tricky task. Just so many repeated cuts and processes were needed. For 40 shelves, that means 80 slats and 80 cleats. I started ripping strips for parts of the table saw until a hidden knot exploded and hit my hands. I decided then it was time to switch to the bandsaw. After each pass ripping at the bandsaw, I took the whole batch over to the jointer to clean up the cut edge. That way each slat would maintain one flat and square face and edge, making thicknessing much easier later on. Then it's back to ripping more strips. The blanks could be cut into one slat and one cleat each. Sadly the footage of making 140 angled cuts was lost. I believe in you to use your imagination. The cleats then receive a dado on both sides to hold the slat. These dados are 12mm tall by 35mm wide. The dados were made in three passes, but I found it was quickest to do one pass on all of them, then adjust the stop block for the next pass. The slats on the other hand just needed a round over to be complete. Finally, time to install it all. I discovered one of the cat's toys had made it on top. And he went crazy almost straight away. No. Glue was applied directly to the MDF edge and using a brush to spread it. While all show surfaces are sealed, I'm trying not to get it everywhere. Not all of the dominoes are inserted. The vertical face frame members can be slid onto the dominoes, then clamps can attach to the sawtooth standards to pull it tight. At the moment the arch pieces are not glued in, but just in place to make sure everything is correctly spaced. 
After the vertical pieces dried, I could glue in the arch pieces. That's when I realized I actually had no way to clamp them while the cabinets were so close to the wall. A simple cleat screwed into the MDF gave me a point to clamp to. I could always remove the cleat, but it's invisible, so they might just stay there. You may have noticed I didn't cover install on the cap pieces, and that's because I, I didn't install the cap pieces. When I cut them, I forgot that there is no neighbouring cabinet over here. And this one is about 25mm uh, short, and it's the same on the other side, so these two need to be remade so that I can then glue it all in. So for now, they're just sitting up there. I'll get to it when I get to it. It wasn't super clear that these are staggered. There's no way I could have a trim piece go all the way across. That was one continuous piece, so there was going to have to be seams. To hide the seams, I made deliberate seams. The piece for the central cabinet has a 9mm overhang. The cap pieces on either side of it are 6mm, and then the final two on the very ends are 3mm. It creates a really nice staggered gradient going in both directions, which is nice and subtle, but doesn't look out of place. To be a proper built-in, we really should have some sort of panel here that uh, starts at the end of the cabinets, hidden by the face frame and extended to the wall, and down below and on the other side. We just haven't decided which way we want to go. Currently, what we are thinking is just a painted panel that sits on the outside here and down below, hiding the melamine, hiding the raw MDF, so that we can store the leaves for our board game table. They still need veneering, but more on that in another video. End of the day, though, this door spends 99% of its time open, so when you're actually in the room, there's no way to actually see the raw MDF unless you stick your head around here and then you look a bit silly doing that. It was six years ago to the day, at least at the time of filming this, that I made the first board game storage, the Box Usurper, and I think that held maybe 10, 15 games, and at the time that seemed like quite a lot and would never exceed that. So to have something as massive as this is, uh, Quite funny to me. We are very very happy with this. I'm very happy with how this has turned out and having so much room to grow is fantastic. This rack here isn't even our games. Our friend leaves his games here to play with us so there is just so much room and that's before we consider all of the storage underneath. But more than that this finishes off the room. This is a dead wall otherwise but the combination of the green, the towering pine, the brass and the hardwood components really create this warm inviting area for us to play games in here and and we do that three to five times a week so it's just it's just really nice i'm really happy with how it's turned out thanks for watching